Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much indeed, Nat. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, let me begin by uh, thanking you for uh, giving me this opportunity and inviting me to uh, kick off uh, events today. Uh, I suppose as someone who has been, uh, as has been remarked, uh, part of the Irish presidency uh, over the last five months, uh, I have seen up close how some of the issues that you're discussing today uh, are playing out in Europe. Uh, and I'm pleased to have this opportunity to stand back from the day-to-day -day events and uh, to reflect on uh, the bigger picture. Having said that, uh, there is always a difficulty for somebody in government uh, to speak frankly uh, to an event like this. Uh, one's remarks are likely to be probed for heresy uh, or departure from the orthodox position of government uh, rather than subjected to scrutiny on merit. Uh, in government, one is expected to do one's thinking aloud in lodge. So I'll try to walk the tightrope between advising on a view from the foothills of the European institutions uh, and at the same time avoid attracting scare headlines about splits in government and rows in cabinet. We're now five years into the worst economic crisis uh, since the Great Depression. It may well be that the title Great Recession is more appropriate because at least the big economies have been able to ward off the worst of what happened in the 1930s. But it's also fair to say that a crisis generated by the failures of the neoliberal right has done little to raise the standing of the political left. There have been some successes, most notably in the election of a new president in France, but Europe can hardly be said to have swung to the left. If anything, the rise of extremism across Europe is a more notable phenomenon and a cause for concern. But can we honestly say that the left has presented a political program which is both convincing as a response to the crisis and which attracts the trust of the electorate? I don't see that we have. We have, uh, we have been far better at diagnosing the ills than we have been at presenting credible alternatives. It is certainly true that there is a major debate going on across Europe about austerity. Many of us agree with the arguments that the simultaneous correction of fiscal imbalances in all member states is deflationary and could be counterproductive. Many of us agree with the IMF argument that countries which have fiscal space should use it to correct deficits more gradually. By fiscal space, I mean the capacity to reduce borrowing more slowly without creating a debt which is unsustainable or pushing up interest rates too far. We're all familiar with the argument and there are signs of some slow shift in the climate of opinion. The decision to, to grant France, for example, and, and other countries more time to achieve the 3% target uh, reflects that shift. But sometimes you can't help thinking that the left finds it hard to get beyond that. Austerity has become a catch-all phrase when in fact austerity is not an objective, it is a method of achieving an objective. The danger of turning a technical term into a slogan, of course, is that you soon cease to distinguish between cases where differences matter. To condemn austerity and suggest workable solutions is absolutely fair. To use austerity as a slogan to rally opposition is also fine, but futile. Ireland, for example, has no option but to narrow our deficit. We're a programme country. 
that was simply unable to borrow from financial markets and was forced to turn to official creditors. This basic fact is still not accepted by some people. In 12 months, our revenues collapsed from 51 billion to 37 billion. More importantly, there's a world of difference between an economy like the United States or France, for example, in terms of size and openness, and what the effect of fiscal policy might be as compared to Ireland. Ireland is small, where exports are worth 100% of GDP, and where the impact of fiscal policy is at best unpredictable. The prescription of some prominent economic commentators may be right for the United States, for example, and is probably, very probably, correct for the Eurozone. But merely to syndicate the same analysis in Irish newspapers doesn't make it right for Ireland. As a small, open economy, what Ireland can do to boost demand unilaterally is limited. The same constraints don't apply, for example, to the Eurozone. So there is no inconsistency in saying that a large country like France, with low interest rates, is right to take some time to correct its deficit, while also saying that Ireland doesn't have that luxury. The other problem with turning a technique into a slogan is that you fail to acknowledge certain important political realities. There can be no doubt that the electorates of AAA countries have come to see the problem as one of debt rather than of growth. I don't agree with them, but you have to understand why they hold that view and be prepared to respond to it. To many people, the opposite of austerity is not growth. The opposite of austerity for such people is debt. And that's a fact which is unavoidable. And it's a challenge to politics to change that, and a challenge that the institutions of Europe cannot afford to obstruct. What that means is that, in terms of both economics and politics, we cannot hang our hat entirely on what is simply, in the end, an economic technique. There has to be a far richer and more developed set of ideas that we present to the electorate based on our core values. There must be uh, economic, but there also has to be, they must be economic, but they also have to be political. And they have to go beyond short-term stabilization to medium-term growth and development issues. I say that because the changes that have taken place in capitalism over the past three decades and the effect of the crisis itself uh, have, been pr have profound political implications. My colleague uh, and party leader Eamon Gilmore recently addressed a meeting of the OECD Ministerial Council uh, that was entitled Inequality, Jobs and Trust, where he made the point that 30 years ago, if economists bothered to think about inequality at all, they assumed that the industrialized economies were gradually becoming more equal. The changes that have taken place since then some driven by politics, some by technology, have reversed that trend. Yes, the graph still shows big differences between countries in terms of how equal or unequal they are, but there has been a generalized trend towards more inequality, which has aff affected even some of the great bastions of solidarity. That, in turn, is undermining or corroding some of the glue that holds us together politically and socially. There is little point in sitting around bemoaning the demise of the post-war European social welfare state. The issue that we have to deal with is how to construct a new social settlement that deals with the economic and social realities of this century, one which commands the allegiance of our electorates. In Ireland, the present government came to office at a time when the economy was in the middle of a financial heart attack. Real economies require a functioning banking system, and the flow of credit is vital for the creation and retention of jobs. 
what we faced here was not just the destruction of a quarter of a million jobs between 2008 and 2011, but the prospect of acceleration of that job destruction uh, if we didn't get a grip on the financial instability. The record shows that we have managed to avert financial meltdown. Now the problem is how to build on that stability to create jobs and growth. But also to do so in a way which treats social solidarity not as a cost or an afterthought, but as a core economic and political asset. And at the same time, we have to work harder to open up our political system to the realities of modern times. What that means in Ireland, for example, is that we've worked hard and made deeply difficult decisions to restore financial and fiscal stability. That's the basis on which we have now to build for the medium term. Growth will, as always, be driven in part by investment, both public and private. Ireland is a highly globalized economy which has developed strengths in a number of different industrial sectors. We have to be ready to promote investment in existing sectors and in sectors that are only now emerging or which do not yet exist. One of the emerging components of the debate in Europe is how to mobilize investment banks to play a greater role in providing credit for investment. Yesterday, for example, I was involved in the launch of the Irish Strategic Investment Fund. Ireland, like a number of member states, is constrained in terms of capacity to stimulate growth and jobs. However, yesterday we announced the establishment of a 6.4 billion Ireland Strategic Investment Fund. The fund will take over the remaining funds in the National Pension Reserve Fund and re reorient that investment uh, in commercial projects in Ireland. Up to now, the National Pension Reserve Fund, in accord with pension fund investment principles, had been investing wherever in the world uh, it calculated to get the best return. That money will be invested in Ireland now, where the funds will be channeled towards productive investment on commercial terms. A key principle of the Strategic Investment Fund is to seek to leverage and maximize its resources by attracting third-party investment. The idea being that the fund's assets can be used as a catalyst to attract additional capital for investment in the Irish economy. As a result, we will get more investment into key sectors to support economic activity and employment. Therefore, we will be able to accelerate investment in sectors of strategic importance, such as energy, water, broadband, and forestry. The challenge, of course, is to achieve a new way of thinking about the value of stimulus on a pan-European level. This requires a shift in mindset by the European leadership. Let me take one example arising from my own experience uh, as president of the EU Energy Council uh, over the last six months. There is a broad consensus across the political spectrum that investment, for example, in energy efficiency is a good thing. It is a triple win for any member state. It reduces energy consumption and so it makes a contribution to addressing climate change. Secondly, it leads, uh, it leads to savings by reducing wasteful spend on largely imported fossil fuels. And thirdly, investment in energy efficiency Retrofit, for example, tends to be job rich, often leading to employment for those in the seriously depressed construction sector. It should be obvious then that as we seek to address the economic crisis that the European system would go out of its way to encourage this type of investment. However, the Union's obsessive focus on control of government deficit levels managed through Eurostat rules, has hindered member states from investing in energy efficiency measures to address problems uh, in the public uh, 
public building stock. I'm pleased to say that in recent weeks, with support from colleagues in some of our member states, and with the support of President Van Rompuy, uh, I have secured a commitment that the Commission will present a paper on innovative financing of energy efficiency programs before the end of the year. I hope that this will clarify Eurostat rules in this particular area on block, one log jam in public investment, both here and in other member states. I have a strong sense that there are many other cases where established rules are trumping sensible public policy and the EU governance institutions are not well suited to swift adoption. Another core component of our approach is the whole area of skills. In Ireland, where we have been through a dramatic and unsustainable expansion of the construction sector, followed by a deep collapse, there is clearly a problem of structural unemployment. We are working to reform our welfare system and our training system to take a far more active approach to this problem. Ireland has traditionally had a relatively passive welfare system where we're seeking to transform, which we are seeking to transform through a major reform program. In doing so, we are not just responding to the needs of the moment, but we're building an important structure both in our social safety net and in the platform of competitive advantage on which all trading nations depend. The kind of skills that a country creates and recreates is central to the kind of industries that it can grow. It is also central to the distribution of income and resources within our societies. In the future, training and reskilling those who lose a job will be just as much part of the welfare code as income support. That is not a new idea, but it is one which we are working hard to implement here in Ireland, led by the Minister for Social Protection. Irish citizens are not alone in having good cause to lament the flaws that have been exposed in the creation of the Euro project itself. Because we were first in, we were foisted with the additional burden of private bank debt. In the name of contagion prevention, Mr. Trichet and Mr. Geithner made common cause to prevent any burden sharing. The result is an indefensible burden of bank debt imposed on Irish taxpayers. Yes, we merit blame and criticism for mistakes made and those directly responsible deserve to be exposed for gross dereliction of duty. But no, we do not deserve having to bear the cost of protecting Europe's banks, which themselves rec recklessly lent to the Irish banking system. The left must accept that without a functioning banking system, we cannot have a functioning market economy. Therefore, we all have a vested interest in Eurozone stabilization, in European Banking Union, and in European Banking Resolution, which is why the Irish Presidency has given such priority to the Banking Union program, a program of measures and its importance to breaking the sovereignty bank debt link. Breaking that link will make a substantial contribution to strengthening the European financial system. Considerable work went into the Capital Requirement Directive, uh, which sets new rules that it will help make sure that European banks hold enough good quality capital to withstand future economic and financial shocks. Ireland can be pleased of our, about our joint contribution to the single rule book, which is a prerequisite for a fully fledged banking union Building on Council agreement reached under the Cypriot Presidency Agreement, agreement has also been reached on the single supervisory mechanism and is on course for adoption uh, in July. Intensive efforts continue to accelerate Council discussions on the recovery and resolution file with a view to reaching agreement on key political issues, hopefully at the June, uh, this month's ECOFIN. In a union besieged in particular by the, employment, the unemployment crisis, 
Progress on these critical issues has taken too long. It may be unpalatable, but unless we fix the banks, we can't fix the economy. History is instructive, but only up to a point. No economist can seriously sustain the argument uh, that inflation is an imminent prospect in the Eurozone. But indefensible levels of unemployment threaten the Union itself. European politicians of the left and right and centre are, for the moment anyway, elected. Only the loony fringes believe in austerity as a policy. Only those who believe in the tooth fairy are persuaded that a small open economy that doesn't have its own currency and can't engage in quantitative easing can afford to ignore a yawning gap between spending and revenues. Hence, the need for Eurozone stabilization and a functioning banking system. It is time that the agreement of June 29th was fully implemented and investment promoted by the European leadership because that way lies growth and jobs expansion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. And I believe the Minister has time to take a couple of questions. Francis. Uh, first of all, as Chair of Task, I want to uh, welcome Pat and thank him for uh, coming here uh, to, to today to speak to us. And we're recognising the tightrope that uh, the ministers uh, constantly have to take to step outside their immediate brief. Um, recalling the pension uh, fund. It's all very well, as I said, to rail against it's all very well, as I said, to rail against uh, austerity. But how does a small uh, but how does a source small country the investment necessary source uh, the investment necessary and growth uh, for development and growth and uh, there is and, uh, there are there is very uh, few of there are very uh, few available uh, tools. Uh, like I said, there are like I said, for example, there are certain areas in the country that you might think make hardly sense. And that for one reason or another, the union, one one director of the union, one director of the union, yes, and for example, yes, but another go down that limb, but another limb, or another limb, right, or say no, or another may not do that, says no, it's contrary, you may not do that, competition, it's contrary to competition law, it's 
Jalela. Come from Jalela. Where, Jalela. Where, Jalela. Where do you source? Uh, Where do you the source? investment from? Uh, the investment and, from? Uh, and uh, the government has taken the view. Uh, the government has taken the view that uh, that this six point four this billion, six point four uh, billion a fund uh, that has been managed up to now a fund that has been managed up to now prudent investments making economies across, across the Western, Western world, world economies across the Western uh, that we ought to reorient that uh, that we ought to make that money available for investment and make that money available for investment in our commercial terms. and there are a number in of emerging and there are strategic are sectors emerging and strategic sectors and uh, there are a number of sectors uh, there are a number of that are essential, that are not that are essential, that require attention, that are like water. Water. that require attention, uh, like water. The government has decided to create uh, a new the government has water utility, uh, in water state utility, uh, in uh, state ownership. You can't uh, fund, you can't the fund creation the of a water utility, creation of a water the installation of meters, the installation of meters to every house, in the, to every house uh, in the country. And uh, the original uh, initial investment. And the original uh, initial uh, investment money. is needed. And uh, uh, without money. We think that's a good example. And, uh, but there are that's a good example. But there are energy are projects in my own area. Energy projects in my own area. But the rate needs to be constantly refurbished. And the rate needs to be refurbished. If you're going to accommodate renewables, if you're going to accommodate renewables, where the rate is weak, I mean, then the rate is weak. In our area, we have the rate of resources, for example. But where the rate is best. The greatest well, where the wind is best, uh, the greatest and, and you'll have to attend to that. Uh, in the area of telecoms, telecoms, in the area of uh, telecoms, in the national broadband plan, we have urban acceptance that in urban uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, fierce uh, competition, uh, fierce uh, competition amongst the private telcos, amongst the private, private telcos, broadband and uh, broadband that competes with anything, uh, that competes with anything. But they're in the less densely populated areas. But they're in the less densely uh, populated the areas. Is not. Uh, the quality of broadband simply is not. And the private sector will not go in. And the private sector will and not go in. And therefore, we have to and go therefore, to work. TV we have to go through um, the TV painstaking, uh, painstaking procedure of going to the state and the procedure of going to the state to invest. To be permitted uh, to invest. Uh, state. Uh, in the state. Uh, bring in a basic broadband. Bring in a basic broadband. And um, and I, I've been asked about forestry. In I, I've been asked about forestry um, in particular. And um, th this government inherited this government inherited bailout agreement with the Trika. Bailout agreement with the Trika that um, requires that, um, the disposal required of state assets. disposal of state mm -hmm. assets. At the time, the motion figure was some five billion. The figure was some five billion. That was about as relevant. That was about as relevant. As in in the my opinion, as the requirement to realize fifty million to realize say fifty million disposed state assets. My counterpart in Greece. My counterpart in Greece since uh, swept away. Since uh, swept told away. That uh, told me that she said we don't have fifty. Million. She said we don't have fifty. Unless we start selling islands. Unless we start selling islands. Similarly islands. here. Uh, Similarly here. Uh, that kind of figure. Was not, that kind of was, not that was not realizable without doing without doing without doing counterproductive damage. Counterproductive uh, damage. Um, I mention it because uh, I mention it because uh, the state forestry company, uh, the state forestry company, company uh, was one of those on the list. Gradually, now gradually intervening two years over the negotiation in two years, well, we whatever state situations are exposed to, whatever state has fifty percent. Fifty percent now go to those money investment now go to job creation investment in job creation in Ireland. The original intention was that whatever the original intention would go to write down debt. Are would go to write down debt. That's the situation. And I expect the government next week will make. I expect the government next week will make a future of creature, which is the Irish forestry company. Separately, separately, my own department is involved. My own department is in involved in having a professional examination having of the synergies. Professional examination of the synergies that might exist as between the moment, as between board which is a peak development company, <coughs> which is a peak development which has some two hundred thousand acres, which has some two hundred thousand acres of Tamcoochia. In terms of whether there are synergies in terms of whether there synergies are synergies that could lead, for example, to the synergy of the norm, for example, to the creation of productive Bioenergy, uh, productive of bioenergy. Uh, and we're looking at that. Now I've already made some uh, comments. We're looking at that. Now I've already made some comments about the, the privatization of uh, the privatization.
creature and her daughter will be the mayor today. A creature and her daughter will be the But I hope that whatever decision is made next but week. But I hope that whatever decision is made next week. Being sick. Being sick. Being sick. Being sick. Being sick. Being sick. You said very, very correctly that the left must create in analyzing the problems uh, crisis. But I think that there are some good suggestions. But I think that there are some good suggestions as well as solving certain problems. Solving certain problems. I'm just referring to one, which I think is very effective for Ireland as for other countries in Europe, which is the gap, drawing gap, and we know that for example, Germany, we know that for example, the German social democrats now have in their program for the coming elections of tax, an increase of tax for income tax, very rich. For the very we know that the gap in Ireland has increased. We know that the gap in Ireland has increased well, I think that's very much as well, and I think that's one of the reasons for social injustice. Uh, for social injustice. Are still and that the rich are still price. taking advantage. The poor are suffering. suffering, and the poor are suffering. Is there any yeah. progress? Is there of any progress of the Irish government close to the narrow the gap, gap at least? To narrow the gap, not at only least. by not only by poor, giving more social benefits to the poor, to but to as well. attack a lot of things as well. The whole problem too much, problem. much the whole bother probably. Okay, so one. Okay, so one last I'm question. Leave it there because I can't just administer. Uh, John. 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 Uh, I'm going to have to leave it there because I'm can't just administer. Uh, John. Uh, Okay, and one final question at the back. Okay, and one final question there at the back. I am definitely not sure, I'm a member of the Labour Party and the Party of European Socialists. I think Pat is right when he says that I am definitely not sure, I'm a member of the Labour Party and the Left Party of European Socialists. I think Pat is right when he says that there's a huge failure of the left in the near the view to the Minister. Yeah, well, it is a question of uh, taxation to say that uh, <coughs> during the years. It is uh, absolutely right. right. Uh, these are to the say the that uh, during the years of the moon, we like to hear the minimum the taxes. That's absolutely right. Better off. In the, in the five years since the crash, uh, the tax change is made. Uh, in the five years since the crash, you know, have uh, the tax change the outcome of uh, have been now that I know have been the uh, have been we have a we have a marginal rate now of fifty two percent. Uh, you have to we have a we have a marginal rate now of the universal percent. social charge uh, which was you uh, have to an emergency tax 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 universal social charge which was an emergency <laughs> tax that applied emergency rules and we changed that uh, emergency tax but which graduates, uh, you know, from 5% or 9%, but which graduates, 9%, uh, you know, and so on, and that is 52% uh, at the top level. Now, and so on, and that is This is where I come back to the argument about Ireland as a small member state this is as where compared I come back to the argument about Ireland as um, a small member state. Paul Krugman writing an economic prescription for what happens in Washington. Paul Krugman, in so far as I'm competent in an economic prescription for I think he's probably mainly right. In so 
But you can't apply a prescription for a market of 260 or 300 million people to a country of 4.6 million. So there are certain things that can be done at, uh, at European level and as between so Europe and, say, the United States about taxation or hiding and wealth uh, and so on that can't be done. Uh, there is by a small state. Uh, so there is a, a tilting point uh, where a in a global economy uh, you certainly will, you can change the tax system to catch very high earners. You can change the tax system numerically. They're very small. But you're not going to catch real wealth uh, unless there is some kind of progress made on international protocols uh, and that it's done at European level. There has been there, there, there have been signs uh, of some uh, reform in the area of hiding wealth uh, and you know reform even the country like Switzerland has recently been obliged to make certain public statements in respect of the conceded uh, wealth and so on. But I have to say, um, I, I have concerns about how much above 52% you can go in terms of wage earnings. I have concerns about how much We are dependent here. We, we, have, uh, we have no future in going down markets. Uh, we have in, a, in a knowledge based economy and in terms of trying to uh, ensure that there is innovation in, in this economy and so on, there is a limit uh, in, in terms of salary earnings, uh, how much you can tax. And I draw a distinction between that and the West. Um, so, you know, we're members of a union. Uh, and so we really do have to you know, approach some of these issues of a union. Uh, as a union. And, and we really do uh, have to and I mean, approach some of these issues. You know, uh, as a union. The, the uh, question uh, about the, the corporate yeah. tax rate, I mean, we're, we're still yeah. a, a union the of very different cultures, uh, I mean, very different economic, economic circumstances. Uh, if you take, for example, uh, the task of confronting this state uh, in terms of recovery from the economic crash, we do have certain advantages. In terms of uh, one of them being the levels of skill in the workforce, uh, the level of education in the workforce. Uh, for example, our participation in third level education as compared to Portugal is a, is a distinct advantage. But in terms of industrial policy and how, from where the trend on a half percent emerged, and, um, how, from where the trend on a half I, I would absolutely emerged. defend that um, in the absence of I, I would absolutely uh, progress being made European wide in the on absence transparency about corporate tax rates that have been in other member states. On transparency um, about corporate tax rates. You know, we all know that the headline risk is yeah. not the real risk. Um, in, in many other countries. You know, we all know that the and uh, is, is not the real race. Yes, of course. You could increase the 12 and a half percent to 15 percent. There wouldn't be any flight. Yes, of course. Either. You could increase the 12 and a half percent. But the advantage to Ireland from the point of view of industrial strategy is that there has been a bipartisan approach on this issue that communicates certainty. Strategy. And I think the challenge for, for us in so far as we can in our tax code is to ensure that that applies. But as you well know, uh, the agreements that exist as between countries and the different system, for example, particularly in the United States, uh, the United States would have to be first movers on what changes they might make. They are not first moves that we can make. Uh, so I think we have to be, we have to be careful it's a country that missed so out on the Industrial Revolution I think we have uh, and that uh, has only built up in a relatively recent years uh, an industrial sector in this country. We have to be very careful about not doing damage, uh, not doing damage to that. Um, in, in terms of Des's question, I mean, I, 
I, I would be delighted to see the opportunity in terms of the insurance campaign and so on uh, to raise some of the issues that uh, I adverted to in, in my opening remarks. And, and, you know, I think we have to learn to intrude them uh, into the central debate uh, because the commission of the law has been over for a long time. Add to that the sclerosis and slow decision time that is apparent at the heart of the union. And slow decision a slow bicycle race that has attempted to deal with the banking crisis. We have to get them first. With the banking crisis. Uh, but after that, we need on a, on a, as, as a party of European socialists across the union, uh, promote certain values and certain policies, certain initiatives and certain strategies. Uh, but if you're confronted with the circumstances confronted with Portugal, stabilization uh, and in the absence of provision for burden sharing uh, across the union I mean if, if a if a bank goes bust in Arkansas uh, it doesn't have implications across the 50 member states I mean there is no has been no provision here for bank resolution I mean one bank brought down our system and we weren't capable of ring fencing it. Uh, and you know these defects have to be put right uh, uh, before we can uh, we can deal with some of the other pressing issues. But may I just uh, just add something on that is, uh, I think it, it's very essential also that what Desmond raised uh, <laughs> this kind of question of a campaign next year for the European election in the sense to go beyond that austerity to enhance the European society. And this goes also in the sense that next week there will be a council of the Party of European Socialists in Sofia and there will be a, for the first time a fundamental program voted. Uh, I, I'm very proud to say also that FEX has a lot contributed to that fundamental program. This could be then a platform also for developing a certain kind of manifesto, which explicitly goes also in the question you raised, Mr. Minister, and which came also from the question of the income tax also. Because it's not only a question to raise taxes higher, it's also a question of taxes, uh, tax justice in, in a way that there is no the problem that you can't avoid to, to pay taxes. And we have now, for example, also a campaign on the European level in the sense uh, against t tax havens, against tax evasion. There is a lot of money to, to can be raised in a way which can be very, very necessarily invested in programs within Europe from these kind of, of, of policies we can do. And I think if the national parties on the national level in, 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 in Europe will accept next year that for the first time we can have the chance that there is one common candidate from our political family who can raise these kind of points, then there is also a choice for the citizen in Europe in a sense to say, well, I would like to have this person as the president of the commission. And this goes then what you were saying, we had the law commission, but this is 20 years ago. And we are now in a situation, let me put it very bluntly on the table, that the commission is not that what is meant in the treaties, the commission is not more than a general secretariat of the council, and this we have to overcome. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that the minister has to go to a meeting now at half ten, and just before he goes, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Tom Healy of Neary, who's going to chair the next.